Hi everyone, good afternoon. I like that introduction. Very hot topic, data and gen AI. Like we didn't talk about it all day. Just all day, right? <laughs> Thanks so much for putting up with all the generative AI gyan that you've been getting all day. Uh, my manager is sitting in the first row, so if I feel any low beat, he's the reason. Um, say hi, Prashant. He did the keynote, so you all probably already know him. Um, so I'm Abhirami Sukumaran, you can call me Abhi. I'm a developer advocate focusing predominantly on Google Cloud databases and data to AI and now data to generative AI journey. Um, today I'll talk a little bit about um, all the database related extensions or applications that you can do with generative AI. And uh, we'll still touch a little bit about uh, some of the important topics on the generative AI front before even getting into generative AI because I want to understand, like you've, you've sat through a whole day of generative AI learning, so I'd rather ask you questions. It's not like it's a keynote, like I have to make some jokes or talk about stuff. Um, I just have, to, I can ask you questions. So I'm going to continue to ask you questions and I want to understand how far along the journey you are. And then I also want, that is first thing, and I also want to talk about some key words that a lot of people hear here and there. Um, which I understood from a lot of folks that they know, they've heard the topics, they know the words, but it still sounds like jargon, that still sounds like, okay, I've heard this, I have an idea, but I really don't know how, what exactly it means or how to implement that. So we'll go through some words like that. And finally, I'll also take you through a quick demo. You don't have to do it, but I'll show you means to get you to do it at your own time, but I will show you step-by-step step how to do uh, data, take your data to generative AI only using SQL queries, okay? So these are the three uh, kinds of, or uh, categories of topics we'll discuss today with me. So like I said, I'll start with a question. I want to ask, not with a question, there's going to be multiple questions, but rem uh, a gentle reminder, if I find the answer is really good, or let's say outstanding, I'll recommend you for a, I'll recommend you for a swag or a gift, or whatever, whatever I, you want to call it, all right? Uh, so we have mic. good t-shirts over there. Do we have there. the mic ready? Okay, awesome. Oh uh, yeah, when you're answering, please remember to tell, say your name so that we don't address you uh, by the color of your shirt. I find it personally boring. All right, so I want you to explain to me what is the difference between ML, AI, and generative AI in layman's terms, like everybody un should understand whether or not you're from the technology background. Who can tell me that? Okay, we have one here. Your name first, and then. Uh, this is Mahesh. Hi, Mahesh. Uh, yeah, basically machine learning involves taking tabular data and doing classification, clustering, and predictions out of it. And artificial intelligence is like mimicking intelligence uh, in computer. And generative AI is something where we generate text, image, audio, or something uh, with a set of pre-learned data and that data shouldn't exist means uh, generating a new text uh, images and audio kind of things um, yes you you have all the points right but there are some gaps over there and there is a small slight mistake as well so I'm gonna give it to the person behind you can you pass the mic hello my name is Sudhanwa sorry so Dhanva. Okay. Machine learning, in layman's terms, machine learning is you build a model, you give some input features and you get an output. So uh, the inputs are called fe uh, features and the output is called labels. Okay, in a machine learning algorithm, there are two kinds. It's like, imagine you have a dog and you train it to fetch the ball. So similarly, in machine learning, you give some input features and you get the output. This is the training data and you ask the machine to come up with a model for future references. So this is what machine learning does. And in machine learning, there are two types. One is regression and classification. Only that? Okay, fine, go on. Okay. Uh, the second part was artificial intelligence, right? Yes, difference between, just in one line, please, in the interest of time. Okay. Difference between ML, AI, and uh, generative AI. Okay, artificial intelligence is something that is uh, made up from all the existing data. Uh, Gen AI refers to uh, creating something out of data which is already there. Okay, 
Uh, thank you, Sudanwa. Good try. Let's hand it over to uh, her over there. Just pass it on to her. Just one last answer from this side, and then we'll close this question, all right? Hello, um, myself, Harini. So uh, generative AI, AI, and ML, AI, if we see it in terms of a Venn diagram, for example, AI would be the outer circle. Inside that would be Gen AI. Inside that would be ML. So AI is basically, it consists of all the neural networks and the models. ML is the way in which we train those models with the data. And generative AI is a part of AI as a whole, uh, where generative AI generates uh, contents like images, um, uh, text, videos, etc. Okay. Uh, okay, fine. Give it to her. And then there's only one, uh, one, si one from this side. Okay. Hi, my name is Aditi. So I'll start with AI. Whenever a computer uh, behaves like a human being, so that is artificial intelligence. That means a machine starts to think like a human. Now we come to machine learning. When we train the machine, uh, like for example, we train a human to learn a specific game, like how to play chess. So that comes under machine learning, that we train our model to uh, classify or to predict something. And now we come to generative AI, which is uh, we, for example, as I mentioned, we are training that machine to do specific things. But when uh, the machine is so smart that it uh, comes up with solutions that we might not have trained on, uh, then that is uh, generative AI. Okay, one last over there, this side. This side, please. I don't know who has been uh, putting your hand up for the longest, but yeah, over there. That person, okay, yeah. Uh, artificial intelligence create um, mimic the human uh, human behavior okay machine learning using machine learning we are creating a small brains okay uh, like uh, some patterns or something uh, using mathematics mathematical tools and uh, generative ai uh, we have already something created uh, some brain and we can put our data okay to thank you Convert, uh, get, get it out, our own answer. Okay, one last answer over here. Sh uh, I want her to try. I, w I just want a clear difference between machine learning. I mean, I'm not impressed with the answer so far, but all of you uh, tried, and I thought the answer with the example of the dog was close enough. Yeah, you go ahead. Uh, so explaining in layman terms, ML will be something like you give images of cats and dogs. You give an image, it will say, okay, okay this is a cat. But AI will be like, uh, you have a home with a lot of appliances, and for example, you enter home, you increase the temperature of AC. Then it will un understand that, okay, a person comes back, then it will automatically increase. Then generative AI is like you give your own data and then it will not only differentiate between like cats and dogs, but it also uh, can do a lot of other stuff also, like it will give you other options, like these are the breeds and all. So, yeah. Cool. What's your name? Sarvani. Sarvani, we can give her a t-shirt. So that was close enough. She was able to bring in the, at least with examples, she was able to differentiate. But if by definition you have to differentiate, I'll tell you, with machine learning, you provide the data. You train the machine to do something. The data is being fed, right? You have the data. It is your data that you're training the model or training the machine on. You build the algorithm or you use an algorithm that's already been built. And you train the data to do something, the machine to do something. With artificial intelligence, it's almost the same thing. It's just that you possibly augment that information with something from the real world, like a real world connect, like uh, information from sensor data, your, uh, for example, human uh, vision images, uh, videos, or information from a uh, live stream of um, a, a video or anything that's happening, uh, live stream of uh, data of a cricket match that's happening. So stuff like that, things that's happening in the real world. So they have an overlap for sure. And with generative AI, the only difference is that you're not feeding that information. The data is not necessarily, you don't have to always provide the data. Yes, of course, with prompt engineering, we've all discussed that a lot, that it's important to provide the context. It's important to add uh, that amount of information to make sure your responses are great, to make sure that your responses um, actually do justice to the business problems you're trying to solve. But that doesn't mean you're training the model itself. You can fine tune the model to respond in a way that you want by providing sample prompts 
sample responses. Say, I have 100,000 records of uh, how, what to ask to a customer support engineer and what response the engineer should provide. Now, I can provide these 100,000 rows as fine-tuning data as a JSON file and then expect the model to respond in a way that I expect it to respond. But that doesn't mean I'm training the under, you're not training the underlying model by providing your additional information, by providing more data to it, right? So the data is not yours. You have not trained the large language model or the model that's uh, behind, that you're using to achieve generative model, generative AI or to generate any, any data, any content that you want. So that is the main difference between the three. And the reason why I brought it up today is a lot of times I get asked even in sessions, like I can do this with the natural NLP API. I have done in the past with my own algorithm, with my own models um, to solve something for entity recognition, to summarize a bunch of text. Now, is it, is it also generative AI? Some, so that is where you have to understand the difference. If you are giving the training data, you're, pay, you're actually do, training the data, right? You're bringing in the data, you're storing it, you're, save, you're spending for the compute of it, you're training the model, and then you're building that um, summarizer or entity recognizer or entity extractor, whatever it is that you're building, then you're, you, or you're using an API for that, and then you're solving that problem. But here, with generative AI, you're not doing anything of that sort. You're not giving your data uh, to come up with a model or, or to ask the model to perform in a certain way. You're just asking a question. You're just uploading a file and saying, can you please summarize what this file says? Or I've been speaking here for the last 10 minutes, probably. And then can you please summarize what Abhinami has been saying for the last 10 minutes? I just want to know it in one line. Or like I asked you, can you say it in one line? So that kind of summarization, without having to bring in your own data to train the machine, that's what the difference is. And you have to understand that because based on that, whatever you're building, uh, or your application that you're developing. So you need to know, you need to make the right choice for what is best or why you need a certain uh, API or a certain model for it. We'll skip that. And you would have heard a lo lot about large language models. I'm not going to go over the entire thing right now because you would have probably heard a lot throughout the day, but um, here is a question. Why is it just called a large language model? The stress here is on language. I'm not asking it, asking you why it's large. I'm asking you, why is it called large language model? Does it mean you can only process information that is in the form of text or structured? Anyone wants to answer this? Yeah, can we have a mic here, please? I know why you know it's large, right? I understand because you would have gone through the foundation session today, yeah, so, so I'm not whenever stressing we on communicate that. We Your name, please. Uh, my name is Lovepreet. And uh, whenever we communicate with someone, we use a term like language, right? So if we are passing videos, images, text, anything, sort of we are communicating uh, with the machine, right? At the end, it's all about uh, conversion of everything into numbers, right? So uh, I think it's a kind of language that we are using. That's why we, it's called uh, language model. Okay, close enough. Can you also give the mic to him over there, right next to you? Because it's trained on language data, Okay, there was one person over there who wanted to answer. Oh, I thought you wanted to answer, I'm sorry. Over here. Language is the easiest. Just answer this question. Can you only solve, or can you only uh, send prompts that are text or structured? Is that, is that why it's called language? No, uh, when we interact with anything, we need a medium to interact, so that is why it is language. Perfect, that's the right answer, and I think I want that is the kind of answers I'm looking for. I'm not ask, looking for anything that's too super hyper technical or in use any word that you have to explain. It has to be understood. It, it has to be simple. The thing is, it, it is a mode of communication. That's why, first of all, it is called large language model. That doesn't mean you can only pass text. You can actually, there are models that support, uh, you can also use, like uh, in the previous talk, we saw how you could uh, store a video as a vector uh, embeddings and process that, right? And then ask questions on top of it. So. All those things are information, all those, thing, all those things are data, but how is it understood? How is it processed? So that is where the language part comes in. And definitely we all know that it's uh, trained on large sets of data with tens of hundreds of billions of parameters, and that's something that you probably already know. Um, and you should know the evolution as well. Uh, Google has been in the forefront of everything that's been open sourced in this journey or in this evolution of uh, transformers to uh, summarizes. How many of you have used like birth summarizer in 2018 when it was a big thing? Right? We used it, but we didn't call it LLM at that point. The reason is it was not commercialized in that particular way. Like we did not use it um, as a 
as a as a product as a consumer facing product that we are using uh, as as we are using it right now so we still use birds there are some people in the industry who used it to summarize text who used it to um, as part of their big uh, applications or ecosystem uh, for the product that they, that they are building right so all of this already existed some of it were open sourced as well um, and that is how we have evolved over time and today we are uh, not even uh, there's actually one part that's missing uh, which is the Gemini, which was launched, and that is not listed here. But remember, that is also in that uh, evolution uh, timeline. You can see right there; it's probably late 2023, but it's missing from this timeline. But add on, uh, add that one as well. So Google has been in the forefront of all of these technologies, models, and algorithms that have evolved over time. It's not something that happened as it seems to be. It's generative AI is not something that happened just overnight or in the last 10 uh, months or 11 months that it has become so famous. It's been there. It's been around for at least uh, since 2017 or 2018 since we've been using it, it's just not represented as we are doing it right now. Um, so, okay, so the, we all spoke about language and why it's important and somebody also mentioned that it is used because it's a mode of communication. So what is it called? The answer is right there on the screen. You're prompting, right? So anyone can tell me why is prompt engineering a big deal? This is where we are entering into the data aspect of um, the session today. Why is it a big, why is prompt engineering such a big deal? I saw the first hand over here. Can you? Because if you can achieve your expected answer with lesser prompts, the lesser the cost. Oh, okay. Different answer. Uh, over here, there was a second one over here. Uh, so that we get the uh, output as specific as we want by giving the proper prompt, the writing the proper input that we want. Yeah, but as so set the context basically. Set the context, but why? Why are you doing it? Look at the bigger picture. Like, what is it that you need to know? Uh, what What should be the strength there in order to come up with? Yeah, over there, please pass on the mic. So basically, it's garbage in and garbage out. So how uh, specific and how correct our prompt is, the correct response we get from LLMs. So it's very important to give correct prompts to get correct answers. Yeah, that we have already established. That's why is prompt engineering is important. I'm asking like the bigger picture of what is so unique about it. Like, if if you're if you're being a, hired as a prompt engineer, what will what will the organization expect of you? What is it that you need to have? It's not a very technical question. I'm asking it from a perspective of the problem that you're solving. Yeah, one behind you. Just this last one, and then we'll move on. I'm Nandish. So it's mostly about uh, giving the keywords, exact keywords, what is required. What do you need to know to know the keywords? Uh, we need to know the what are the requirements of the code. OK, stop there. So yeah. you said the requirements. So yeah. who, would who would give you the requirements or what if you know the requirements by yourself who are you what what are you expert at i'm a prompt engineer <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a good answer you give him the t-shirt anyway <laughs> but yeah i'm not going to uh, uh, prompt at another person right now i'll just move on the thing is um, yes so you all had the right answers but the answer that i was looking for was closer to the business data requirement right it's it, the requirement he got so close there is a requirement that is required but if you don't know the industry if i don't know let's say i'm building an or uh, building a chatbot for an automotive industry if i don't know the business if i don't know what i'm solving for what kind of prompts would i provide something that i know shallow right something that i know on the surface about what is the output and what's the what's the input and how what the output should be like maybe i can look at historical information and maybe i can do a machine learning manually on my own and then try to understand what i need to ask but the best ideal part would be if I know both, if I know technology and if I know business, if I know to ask the right questions, because that is when you will get the right um, response for you, right? So that is why, I mean, a lot of people think that it's a really hard thing. That's why prompt engineers like are on demand. But what I've understood, having spoken to a few people who call themselves prompt engineers now, what I've understood is they have the business, they have the acumen for um, both business and technology. They know what they're doing. They have been in that industry. They, they know that inside out. They know what, what will break if uh, they give a certain input or what question to ask or what kind of response their customer support or tech, uh, the support engineer should provide. So that is the kind of information that you should be aware of when you are prompting um, to know what you're solving for. You would have... Um, so when you're prompting, you would have seen the... How many of you know the zero-shot prompt, one-shot one prompt and all? 
Have you, did you go through those sessions? So just, uh, I don't want to talk about each one of those in detail, but your prompt, it's great if your prompt can have a context. It's great if you can, if you can give more information, supporting details for your prompt. And also, it's ideal if you can come up with examples, right? What does your prompt look like? What does your response look like? So zero shot prompt is asking a, f a free form question. Uh, why is the sky blue? Or why does it rain? Or why is this uh, tree leaves green in color? Something like that without examples. Uh, structured from a prompt has a little more structure. It has context and it has some examples. Now with examples, if you give one example, it's called a one shot prompt. If you give few or more examples, more than one, it's called a few shot prompts. Now, Vertex AI, how many of you have has, uh, used Vertex AI in the room or aware of? Can you tell me what it is or what you've done with Vertex AI? Yeah, so I use Vertex AI when, uh, so basically my college has a GDSE and uh, I was doing the Cloud Computing Foundations course. So that time I used Vertex AI where uh, one of the exercises that I did and I found pretty interesting is basically giving it some context and you give it some examples on uh, input and an output that you're expecting. And based on that, you can ask it some stuff and it gives you output. So based on this, I was actually working on a small project where I tried using this, but Wait, then- Wait, you're, you're explaining AutoML to me? Uh, no, 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 actually Vertex AI itself, you can give it like a context and then- uh, Oh, you you're it's generative AI, okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. okay. You're, you're in, so it was called the generative AI studio. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you were in the generative AI studio yes. and then you, okay, that's what you used it for. Yeah. So and what is the model that you used? Uh, I think it was BERT, uh, the, th the text uh, something, I, I forgot Bert. the exact name. No, 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 not the word. If you tell that, you get a gift. If you tell which model you used, um, you get a gift. Um, wait, it's text something. I forgot text what it is. what? I'll give you a clue, it's an animal. It's an animal, bison. Yes. yes. Okay. Give him a. <laughs> Yeah, so the project that we did was like, uh, you just I was too lazy to go through YouTube videos to study. So I was just like, transcribe it, summarize it, and make it like a chatbot so you can ask it questions and stuff. So I even used Vertex AI once because it was too costly, I couldn't use it later, but it was pretty interesting. That's okay, that's too much it. information, sorry. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Thank you so much for uh, sharing that experience with us. But definitely uh, try out Vertex AI. It's, it's fun, it's more than anything, more than building your application or more than learning stuff. I have personally found it fun. Every time, like I'm feeling low or something, I'll just open that page, it's colorful. It ha I mean, colorful in the sense it has so many models, it has the variety that it has, it just, it just fills me up. I don't know why, I don't know if you feel the same way, but it's a one-stop shop for all your machine learning, AI, artificial intelligence and generative AI um, uh, applications or requirements, I would say. So just check it out. Uh, it has Model Garden, it has all the for Google's, for Google Cloud's foundation models, other open source models that are housed in Google Cloud, and then task-specific categorization of the models, both AutoML and custom and other APIs. And then we have Generative AI Studio, which is now looking, is, is it, it now is called Vertex AI Studio. Uh, and then you have prompt design, prompt tuning, fine tuning, which is what he said that he tried out um, when he was trying to use Vertex AI. And then you have ML platform where you can build the end-to-end -end ML pipeline. So all of those things are available. I'll, I'll show that in a bit hands-on. Um, I mean, you can, if you want to try this out, if you want to try Vertex AI right now and the uh, lab that we'll be discussing for the, in the last five minutes, we are in the third part. I'm going to start talking about the databases and the extensions. You can scan this and uh, use these credits for accessing Vertex AI and also the implement the code lab that we are going to discuss. You don't have to take out your laptops now because I understand that uh, you have to connect to hotspot and all, it'll take a lot of distraction, so which I don't want. But uh, you can try it out later today. Um, so use this. Done? Yeah? Cool. So this is what Vertex AI looks like. Go to console.cloud.google.com. Right, that's Google Cloud Console, just search on Google, and then you'll land on Vertex AI Console. If you're just playing around with the Vertex AI Studio, just to build some prompts based on uh, the models that are already available, um, you can, now there is another model that's listed. If you go to this, you would see uh, another model that's listed, that is Gemini as well. The responses are amazing, so try that as well. But with Gemini, you can do a lot more things, like multi-model and stuff, but with uh, the plain generative, in the Vertex AI Studio, if you use text Bison or other models, the, chat bison or other models, you'll be able to uh, use the older models and then you'll be able to uh, pass a uh, rec prompt and get the response and try it out here. And all those uh, different types of prompts that we discussed, right? Free form, uh, structured, zero shot prompt, f uh, few shot prompts, those things you can try out here as well, right? So moving on, all right.
So um, I just want to talk a few things about uh, taking your data to generative AI. So I'll have like three minutes of talk about this, and then the last three minutes, I'll show you uh, the console, the BigQuery console, and I'll show you the queries that you can run in order to build the models. That's all we are going to do, right? So um, how many of you have used Google Cloud databases, either SQL, Cloud SQL or Spanner, BigQuery, anyone? In, okay. Can someone tell me if you have used the um, BQML as, or any ge generative AI or machine learning aspect of the database? Have you used it for doing ML from the database, right, where the data lives, using SQL queries? No? Nobody? Okay, so I'm not, this doesn't qualify for a question then. So that is the, that is the power of Google Cloud databases. The thing is, you can bring in generative AI or AI or ML or any API that we saw in the previous slide. You can bring those in if they are supported, if they are exposed as remote functions. You can bring those in as um, remote function calls from the databases. Now, what, which databases support that? There's Cloud Spanner, BigQuery supports it. And also you have Cloud SQL, which supports it in two different ways. One, you can also call these APIs as remote functions. What APIs we're talking about? All these ML APIs, the, even the NLP APIs, and some of uh, generative AI APIs are also supported by the databases. So you call them just by using some DDL statements. What is a DDL statement? Can someone tell me? Example, with example. Over here, he put his hand up first. DDL stands for data definition language, uh, like create, update. Of what? Create, uh, update, create of what? Create of table. Database objects, basically, yeah, not just tables, anything. Yeah. All right, so I'm, I'm glad that uh, people are still, how many of you are like SQL enthusiasts? What is your name? You also get a t-shirt. Mahesh. Mahesh, Mahesh gets a t-shirt because we are ending the session and I have one last question which I'll reserve for the last part. How many of you have used uh, SQL as your um, mode of, like SQL is your main uh, programming language or not, a, it's not a programming language, but you use SQL on a daily basis. Like you're a backend programmer or you database developer. Cool. So imagine that you're able to do analytics, you're able to do machine learning, you're able to do AI and generative AI, all from the scope of database, right where your data lives, only using SQL queries, like DDL. With DDL, you'll create that model, you'll register the model in the specific database, and with the DML, which is, what is the statement? Select and all, right? It's, I'm sorry, it's um, updates, updates and inserts. With updates and inserts, you can add those data into your, you can add those, um, write, write the model's results back to your schema, back to your tables, right? And then you can write queries using select queries. So in just with just three statements, you will be able to bring the power of AI, ML, and generative AI to your data, right where your data resides. So all the databases that we're talking about, SQL, Spanner, BigQuery, AlloyDB, they all support this. But in addition, AlloyDB and SQL, uh, Cloud SQL, which is what I'm referring to as SQL, they have support for PG vector extensions. Okay, this is the last question for the session. What is a vector? And what is a vector database? Okay, we, can we have the mic over here? I heard you, uh, I heard the other speakers talk about this, that's why I'm not explaining and asking questions instead. From, if we get a line, we try to convert it, each words You into get a, a what? If we have a line. Line, okay. Yeah, if we have a line of a language or she is a, he is a, a man or something like that. Mm -hmm. So it will convert that particular word into vector embeddings okay. from either BERT embed embedding vectorizer or some other vectorizer or transformer vectorizer it will use and it will convert each words into vector embeddings. No, no, then I'm just asking what is a vector, one line, what is vector? Vector is just mathematical word for the w uh, letters or the language that we use. You want to try? Thank you, thanks, that's close enough. Simpler, rep simpler answer, just, you can answer this in three words actually. Sequence of numbers. Okay, uh, anyone else numbers. wants to try? I want to, I want two lines of answers. First line should tell me what are vectors. Second one should say what are vector databases. And because the last question, let's add one more. Give me some examples of vector databases, if you know, in Google Cloud. A line with a direction. Vector. Oh. Like you can. I mean, that is what a vector is. But in terms of, you can add a little more story to it. Now, like please. there are dimension you can represent a line in. So in space. Fine. A line you can Give represent. it to him over there. I'm not impressed, but it's a good answer though. It's a right answer. It's not wrong, but. 
uh, vectors are basically ordered list of uh, numbers which can represent anything. For example, perfect. That's all I wanted. Yeah, which can represent anything. Represent your data, your information in the form of numbers. That's it. Move on to the next question. So What's vector, a vector database, database just utilize that to represent anything uh, as a collection of numbers or a collection of numbers. So okay. if you have images. Why do we need vector databases specific? You all know that most databases now support, or not just not just now, in the, even in the last 10 years, they, or five years, let's say five years, they have supported storage of uh, array of vectors. Right. Oh, sorry, array of loads. Why do we need a specific native vector database? So that similar things are situated close to each other. Perfect. Give a big round of applause. That is the right answer, and this is a very impressive answer too. That one is really important. So that you, they are indexed in such a way that related answers, similar answers, uh, the neighboring information are present closer together. So that is how most of the search, most of the analytics and everything is happening when it comes to vector search and indexing. Now, uh, what the third question was around if you know any vector search uh, data, uh, any vector search options in Google Cloud, do you want to answer that? You can if you want, no. All right, so uh, you have Cloud SQL, which has ex uh, support for PG vector extension, same thing with AlloyDB. Um, and with Spanner, you can indirectly connect to uh, vector search, uh, which is in Vertex AI. Uh, so you use workflow and data flow jobs. You can also build your own uh, PubSub jobs to transfer the data from Spanner to vector search. And vector search is Google Clouds, that is uh, Vertex AI's method of performing vector search uh, and indexing. It's, they, they call it as vector search database, but I don't prefer calling it a database because it does a lot more. It returns the most relevant information. It, it performs searches on top of it, at in, it, and it indexes and everything. So it's called vector search. That's within Vertex AI platform. Check that out as well. It's really interesting. You could create an index from the vector search uh, console or the vector search database page, and you can expose that index as an endpoint, which, uh, which is an HTTPS REST endpoint, which means you can use that index on any web application of your choice, so you end up building applications on top of it. So now, does it give you a little bit of a, a picture of how to move your data in, uh, from the database? Not move, but how to bring your application along the journey of data to uh, storing it somewhere, to converting it into vectors, or doing any other form of generative AI, or even if you want to vector search. You understand that whole pipeline, right? So that is what I wanted to uh, kind of cover today. And uh, two things which I wanted to show, I promise is the last thing I'm showing. Uh, no, second last thing I'm showing. Uh, like I promised, so there is a code lab. Um, I'll also show the QR code where you can find the link to the code lab. You can try it out at your own time as well. Um, so this is the main part, right? So create a, a create a remote ML model, right? So this is the DDL statement that I was talking about. So what I'm doing here is I'm exposing the text bison model, which somebody answered correctly. I'm exposing that as a remote function. It is already available with this remote service type in BigQuery. So I'm invoking that and I'm creating a model, registering it as a model in BigQuery, which means in the next step, I'm actually writing just a select query, right? I'm just writing a select query to invoke that model using this construct called ml.generateText. So once BigQuery sees this keyword, generate text keyword, it looks for two arguments or two parameters. One is the model and two, is a data set that you want to use on the model. So which model I'm using? Text Bison, right? In here I showed you the uh, text-based generative AI model. So what is my prompt? Just some prompt, like why is the sky blue? So it will call that. Now, right now I'm just giving you a random example, but if you go through this code lab, it will actually have a proper prompt engineering done for a data set that actually is stored in BigQuery and the table that is created within that data set. So do check this out, just two steps. And the final step, flattening, it's just that BigQuery has this um, uh, this uh, this thing called true as flattened JSON output. So your output, if it is nested, you won't be able to make good sense of it. Rather, if you use this true flag for flattened JSON output, you could get the result that you want and directly use it as a string. So that's the only difference. So it's hardly like five steps. Try it out at your own time. So let me give you a QR code for that as well. Sorry, so all the all the code labs that are related to generative AI that we ran as part of Code Vipassana, that's a hands-on program, hands-on series that we did, that we started earlier this year. But in the last quarter of this year, we did season four, which was entirely focused on generative AI. We had about 11 projects. Uh, each one is a separate use case, individually taking data to AI. And we had different databases. All of those use cases were around um, 
building generative AI application which are more meaningful. Like you will build, you will upload a YouTube video and ask questions, and then you will build build a chatbot uh, using Vertex AI's APIs, and then you will build a movie success score prediction application. Uh, not not prediction, uh, insights application, because it's generative AI, you don't have to predict, you can just ask questions, right? Even prediction questions can be asked. And stuff like that, they're very engaging use cases. I just got feedback right now from some of the participants who are here as well, who, who said that each use case was so engaging that they couldn't stop. Like one was better than the other, so I would uh, encourage. So this code lab that I was referring to ri right now is also listed there. It's the first code lab in that list. So try it out at your own time. And uh, I know time's up, but if I'll be around for some more time if you have questions. Thank you so much.